Well, there was a woman who for years just couldn't get any sleep because she was afraid, she was worried, and she was anxious that there would be a burglar that was going to break into her house. And so her husband did his best to convince her otherwise because it was really an irrational fear. Nothing like that had ever, ever happened for either of them to this point. So they would go to bed, and she would toss, and she would turn, and eventually she would always sit up in bed and say, I just can't sleep. I know someone's going to break into the house. What, what do I do? And this went on for years. And finally, one night, her husband heard a noise. And he sat up and he thought to himself, are you kidding me? Is this, is this real? And he heard some more stumbling around downstairs. So he jumps out of bed and he races downstairs. And you know what he came face to face with? It was a real life burglar. <laughs> A real-life burglar standing right there. And after the initial shock wore off of the two of them looking at each other and then figuring out what was about to happen next, he interjects and he says, hang on, hang on just a minute. Before, Before you do this, would you mind coming upstairs to meet my wife? She has been waiting for you for 10 years. So, the little truth coming out of this story right here is that a burglar can steal from you once, but the burglar of anxiety can steal from you over and over and over again. It could begin to rob you for a lifetime. Raise your hand for a second if you've ever been worried. Okay? Man, I envy those of you who did not put your hand up. (laughs) But do this. Raise your hand if you've ever been worried about something that has not happened. Yeah. Isn't that nuts? That's most of our worries, actually. There was an article that said 85% of the things most people worry about are things that will never happen. And it goes on to say, 97% of what you worry about is just a fearful mind punishing you with exaggerations and misconceptions. That's pretty heavy. You may have tried at times feeling anxious just to zone out and hope that it went away. Or maybe you even laid down in your bed and closed your eyes trying to get some sleep And then those thoughts just start creeping in. They start attacking. They start trying to steal your peace away. But imagine this. Imagine if you had a peace that passed beyond all understanding. Imagine having a peace that doesn't really even make sense that you had that peace. You might even think to yourself, hey, I have this peace right now, but it doesn't make sense because I actually have some legitimate reasons to feel anxious right now, so what's going on that I have this peace? In a world that is so bombarded with noise and with fear and with tension and with brokenness and with anxiety and with depression, I would say this, church, It is time to be stable in unstable times. It's time. And we're promised this stability. We sang about this stability already this morning that is promised to us this peace from God in Philippians chapter four. So we're picking up where we left off from last week in Philippians four. And this is the part where the Apostle Paul begins to conclude his letter, and he wants to leave these first century believers with a word of encouragement and to give them some direction for the path forward. But here's the deal. These these believers are about to face 
a really bad time. Because at this moment in history, there's this guy named Nero. And he's the Roman emperor. And this guy is out of his mind. He's tyrannical. He's power hungry. And in just a short amount of time, he's looking to ramp up his efforts to attack Christianity. In essence, he wants to wipe Christianity off the face of the planet. And so these followers of Jesus are in for some really, really difficult circumstances that are coming up. And on top of that, they've got their leader. They've got their, their pastor and their spiritual father who's in prison. And they're not sure if he's even going to make it out alive. So their world has been turned upside down here. And in some ways, I would say that you and I can even kind of relate to what's going on. I've been walking this earth long enough at this point in my own life to have had some experiences. A matter of fact, I, I, I know I've been alive long enough because I was meeting a couple of guys maybe a week or two ago and as I'm meeting these, these guys and shaking their hands, I'm thinking, these are my peers, potential new friends, until one of them shaking my hand goes, it is nice to meet you, sir. <laughs> so I recognize that I've probably lived at least half of my life to this point. And I don't remember a time where it seemed like there were more things in, in my life and the world around me that we're becoming undone. It's, it's dark out there. And I think we need this stabilizing force now more than ever. And without it, it feels like we're on a ship that's lost at sea, being smashed and tossed by these waves and this wind of a spiritually lost culture and an irreverently broken society. It's time to be stable in unstable times. We need it, and the world desperately needs it as well. So what does stability look like, and how do I hang on to this? Let's jump into our passage, this section of Scripture, starting with verses 4 and 5 again. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Think about this. The Apostle Paul said, I've been beaten, I've been tortured, I've been constantly on the run, my life is always in danger, and now he's in prison here, not knowing what the outcome will be, and yet he says this verse, rejoice in the Lord always, again I will say rejoice, let your reasonableness be known to everyone, and I think Paul has tapped in to a deep community with the Trinity. And so he's able to talk about rejoicing even in these circumstances. And don't you love how that verse is written? Rejoice in the Lord always again, I will say rejoice. It tells, it tells me that Paul, Paul's a preacher because preachers like to do that. They like to repeat something in order to make a point. Let me say that again. They li- Just kidding. You get it. You get it. So if there's something important, then it's going to be repeated. And so Paul repeats it because he wants to make sure that the audience, that the hearers understand what he is saying. So the word rejoice is the verbal form of joy. It's the actioning of joy. It's living joy out. If you have joy you will rejoice. In other words, to rejoice is to put joy on display. And when you think about rejoicing, who do you think of? When you think about people who rejoice, what does that look like? Who are those people? I can think of some family members, and I can think of some of you here, and really, as I think about this, one of those people, to me, she sits right back here, has no idea that I'm talking about her right now, but I think about Dee LaRaga, 
who's right there looking around going, wait, it's you, D. I think about D right back there. Because every time I see you, D, you have this smile on your face and you glow rejoicing. You are someone who delights in life and I can see that. Aren't people who delight in life, aren't they just delightful? They really are. They show what it looks like to live a life of rejoicing. The opposite is true on the other end, right? Someone who is grumpy is pretty draining. If I see the grumpy guy coming, I might think to myself, oh gosh, do I have to talk to this guy again? He's so wearing. And maybe, hopefully he didn't see me look at him, you know, and wander off. Anyway, look back at the text with me because Paul is being really specific to something here. Notice that he's not exhorting them with this blanket optimism that doesn't really mean anything at all. Paul is not singing songs to them saying, don't worry, be happy. He's not, he's not doing that to them. He's really specific. What he says is rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Let me put it this way. Life is tough, but God is good. We all know the first part of that, right? Life is tough, but God is good. Do we know that part? Do we think that part? Do we speak that part? Here's where we find our joy. It's in the Lord, and it's not in our circumstances. You cannot allow yourself to be held hostage to your circumstances. If you try to find your joy in your circumstances, your life is going to be a mess. So time out just for a second. What is your circumstance? What are your circumstances? What are those difficult things? What is that difficult thing that you are facing? I want to show you this picture. It's a picture of a lighthouse, and it's sitting in the midst of these massive waves in the ocean. And I've seen this before And so maybe you've seen it as well. And when I was trying to find this picture on the internet, lighthouse and waves, seeing all kinds of massive waves, it's it's pretty intense. I've got a healthy respect for the ocean. This is actually a real picture. That's That's what I was looking to find out. It's a real picture. It was taken in 1989 by a photographer who was flying in his helicopter, seeing waves crash against this lighthouse. You can just sense the power that these waves have as they crash against this thing. And then looking really close, you see the lighthouse keeper, this dude that looks like he's just popping out to check the weather as this massive wave smashes against the other side of this lighthouse. He actually didn't even know about the massive waves at that moment. He said that he was opening up to see what, was, what that noise was. He heard the helicopter out there. And so he was peeking at the helicopter. But at that time, in that moment, in that spot, he was safe. And he was confident. To me, this is a great illustration of what Paul must have been like to be stable in an unstable time of life. But recognize that Paul is only stable that way because he's continuously trusting God who is his one true source of constant stability. That's why Paul was able to do it. In 2 Corinthians, Paul has shared, I was lost at sea, I was shipwrecked, I spent a day and a night adrift at sea, getting tossed by waves around me. But my life has a stabilizing force regardless of my circumstances. And so this is what Paul is trying to convey to these early believers here. Proverbs 15, 15 says, All the days of the afflicted are evil, but the cheerful of heart has a continual feast. 
The cheerful of heart has a continual feast. See what we did right there? You remember. So what is it that they feast on? It's peace. They feast on peace. So rejoicing sets the table for the feast of peace. Let's look at verse five again. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand, regardless of your circumstances. Paul is saying it's actually reasonable to rejoice because the Lord is at hand, which simply means God is near. God is present. Verse six, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, and that's asking God with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The word anxious, it's an interesting, important word here. It's the Greek word marinao. Listen to how it was formed. Marinao comes from two words put together. And when you understand that, you'll understand the definition of anxiety. Marizo is to divide. And then nos is the mind. So when you put those two words together, marinao, you have a word that means to divide or tear the mind. It's a perfect description of anxiety. Anxiety is when your mind is divided between legitimate thoughts and destructive thoughts. And the destructive thoughts, remember, it's very likely those things will never happen in the first place. It's a non-reality. So anxiety will take your mind in two different directions. So we need to protect our minds. Look at verse seven. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So here's the help for your anxious thoughts. You ready for it? Here it is, the big unveiling. Come before God and pray. And some of you may have been disappointed in that moment when I revealed that to you. Because you may be thinking, isn't, isn't that just the, the Christian routine answer to things? You know, there's only a handful of questions you need in church to know the answer to. And the answers are God, Jesus, the Bible, pray, right? You might be thinking, that doesn't work for me. I already pray a lot, and I'm still really anxious. But perhaps we need just a little shift in the approach to our prayer. Go with me on this one. Notice carefully what Paul says. You are to pray with thanksgiving. So how are we supposed to pray thanking God when I don't even know the outcome? I'm in the middle of some seriously difficult things. How am I supposed to give thanks to God when I don't know how it's going to end up? And I think that's a really fair question. This is what Paul is imploring us to do in this passage, to pray and thank God even though I don't know the outcome. You see, that's the prayer that thanks God for every possible outcome because you know who God is and you know that God is good and you know that God sits on the throne and you know that he has your best interest in mind. I was talking to a close family member this last week. He was telling me about this transition in his job. First of all, a year ago, he moved from one state across several states to a brand new place. God provided. Then he got a brand new job. He didn't have a job. His job didn't transfer over to this new place, but God provided a new job. And then at this new job, he was telling me it was tough because of all the bickering and all the chatter. It wasn't a good company. The higher-ups were not even watching out for the management team. They weren't set up to succeed, and so the management team 
were kind of floundering and taking it out on those beneath them, which he was one of those beneath them. And yet, in a difficult season over this last year, he was telling me about the goodness of the job that he just had, which, by the way, he was losing. And so now, he's being transferred to a different place, a different location. But the beauty was, while people are chirping in his ear, peers from the same place are telling him, oh, you're going to hate this manager. Oh, this person is going to treat you horribly. Oh, you're going to get fired because they just don't like people in general. You know what he, he was able to take a step back, and he actually told his friends at work, I'm not worried about it. You know why? Because God provided for me. He provided this job for me, and in a really quick transition, he's already provided another job for him. And he's just looking forward to it. He says, I don't have to worry. I might lose my job, yeah, but God's got me. He's done it before. He's going to do it again. Isn't that cool? That is a perspective shift. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. So God has your best interest in mind. Which, by the way, it's his best interest that overflows from God's best interest onto you. He has your best interest in mind. Yeah, sin, sin entered into the world, and then everything got messed up at that point. But God has not left us. He still sits on the throne. In his plan, he redeems broken things. That's what he does. And he's able to use those things in order to build you up, that's who he is. And the cross is the greatest proof of that ever. God could use anything, even tragedy. Not that he causes it, but he can redeem it for something that is great. Philippians 4 Eight and nine. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. There's a little bit of wordplay. That happens right there in that last verse. Paul is brilliant, even in his writing. In verses six and seven, he talks about the peace of God. Pray with thanksgiving, and you'll have the peace of God. And now here in verse nine, he flips it, and he talks about the God of peace. And maybe you're listening to this right now, and you feel like, man, I don't, I don't know. I don't sense God's presence. I've got a lot going on, and I don't sense God's presence. Or what on earth do I have to be thankful for? Have you seen my life? Have you seen the things that are going on in my life? It seems like I just can't catch a break here. One of the primary reasons you might feel that way is because of what we're talking about right here, what we're reading right here. C.S. Lewis puts it in this perspective when he said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but, be, but because by it, I see everything else. Are you thinking about what is true? Is that where your mind is? Are you thinking about what is honorable? Are these the types of things that you're placing on your mind? Is that what you're focused on? The things that are just and the things that are pure. Is that where we're at? Or are our minds absorbing or focusing on what is impure? What is unlovely? What is unloving? What is not excellent? We're not worthy of praise. If that's what we're focused on, if those are the things that our mind is absorbing, 
It's no wonder we're unstable. My heart really goes out to a lot of people with this, especially goes out to this younger generation coming up with the things that they've got influencing their lives from the time that they're born until now. We have a generation that's being raised on essentially an addictive form of identity. It's being, it's being told to them, and it's incredibly destructive. It's called click addiction. Their identity is being handed to them. And this is why in large amounts, we see these massive waves of depression and anxiety and even loss of life like we've never seen it before. Why? It's because we live in a culture, in a society that's bombarding us with this stuff and it's telling us this is where you find your identity. It's either here or it's with a mouse staring at a screen. Meanwhile, the words of Scripture say, free yourself from that. Think about what is lovely and what is pure and what is honorable. Look at verse 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Again, I go back to something that our friend C.S. Lewis said. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. So where is our focus? What do we focus on? Christian peace is not the absence of troubles. It's a peace that is unshakable even in the midst of troubles. During difficult times, Christians are called to remember the living God who works all things out for the good, for his good and for our good to those who love him. And if we set our heart on anything beside God, we can lose our peace. And not just can, we will. We will lose our peace. But if our greatest love is the unchanging God, then our peace can never be taken from us. It's interesting. Our passage this morning started with a command. It's a command, rejoice. Paul wasn't joking around when he said it. And the fact that he gives this as an order, it tells us something. It tells us that joy is a choice that we get to make. Make the choice to rejoice. Joy is a choice, and it's not a feeling. It's a decision. It's far more than just a sensation that we get. It's the pathway to peace as we pray with thanksgiving to God. It's something that you choose to do. You wake up in the morning and you say, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord today. That's what I'm going to do. That's where you say, look, I may not get all that's going on around me right now, but I do know that God is on the throne. I do know that he is faithful, and I believe that. I believe I'm a child of God, and he's got me covered here and now. He's got me. So I'm not joyful because my circumstances are favorable, because oftentimes they are not. And I'm not joyful because the people around me are wonderful, sometimes, but oftentimes they are not. But a huge part of being stable in unstable times is the ability to rejoice in God always, to pray with thanksgiving to him and allow his peace to invade this temporal space. Pray with me. Father, that is what we ask for from you here now today. We ask that your peace, as we cry out to you, Declaring, decreeing, saying that we trust you, Father. Jesus, we trust in your work on the cross. 
Spirit, we trust that you will be here to walk out our days empowering us. God, we thank you. Even though I don't know tomorrow, I thank you for the end of this circumstance, even though I don't know how you're gonna work it out or what it's gonna look like, I give you thanks, knowing that you've got this. Would your peace invade this space more than we've ever experienced it? We ask for your freedom. In Jesus' name, amen.